so as Arthur said, uh, the topic is going to be about uh, compile time computations using templates in C++. Mm, he said that it's going to be a useful topic, but actually I'm uh, not so convinced about this. So b before we begin, I wanted to, to maybe warn everyone that this is uh, not a terribly, terribly uh, practical uh, topic. Most of the examples that I will provide are pretty academic. But I think it's still very interesting, and it's uh, it definitely helps you understand how how templates are actually resolved by the compilers, and what what is actually possible uh, when using them. At the end, I will also provide a couple of more, maybe more uh, practical examples, also how you can use this to to in in, in actual production code. Uh, okay, so let me just share my screen. Okay, can everyone see it? Yes. All right, so that's just the topic. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that everyone here uh, would be familiar with what uh, C++ templates are, so I won't spend too much time uh, talking about them. It's just important to, to, uh, to remember that those are not uh, concrete compiled objects. Those are not actual classes or functions. These are just uh, templates that will be compiled into classes and functions once all the template arguments are, are substituted. And uh, this uh, compile time computations that I wanted to talk about, this is usually described as template metaprogramming in C++. And it's called metaprogramming because this doesn't actually use any values or variables or instructions in the same way that uh, regular code is using in the way that C++ was meant to be used. Instead, it just uh, leverages the possibilities of templates and uh, uses basically types as, as everything uh, that is used for, for the computations. So instead of values and variables, we'll just be seeing types declarations. Uh, so the most basic, uh, basic feature of templates that uh, allows us to, to use them for more, uh, more complex programming is the possibility to the, to define recursive templates. So templates that will be the, that are using themselves in their definitions in some way. So the most common example of uh, using this to perform computations would be to compute a factorial using on nothing but templates. And this is a simple example of how this can be accomplished in C++. So you can see there's a template class described over here named factorial. That is that has one template argument, which is an integer, and basically this this factorial should compute the value of the of the factorial of the number n when it is uh, substituted. So you can see that there's just one field in the class, and this is a static const expression integer, which will hold the value of the result of our computation. So this will definitely be compiled and, and uh, at compile time. The compiler sees that we are over here substituting the number 10 as the template argument. We're taking the value of the field F and this should give us the value of the factorial of number 10. So to actually compute this, we are multiplying the, the provided number uh, by the factorial of a number one less. So basically how you compute a factorial. Of course, this won't actually work the way it is provided above, because we don't didn't provide any uh, any base uh, case for the recursion. So this will try to uh, compute the the factorial of uh, of the following number, uh, and it, it it has no way of stopping in this computation if it's in this recursion, and. What we will get in the, if we try to compile this is uh, an error that will look like this. And it is basically the template and compile time equivalent of a stack overflow because uh, here the recursion just uh, breaks through the limit that is usually uh, enforced by the compiler on the maximum depth of, uh, of template recursion. So in this case, it was set to 900 and this was easily surpassed and we get an error like this. 
that says that the maximum template instantiation depth was exceeded. This is easily uh, amended by providing a, a base case for the recursion. So we provide an additional template specialization where we provide a value for the argument. So this would be the general case for the template and then a more specific case when uh, for the number zero, we just uh, provide the number one as the value for the field F. So this way, if we try to compile this, it will actually give us the number. It will continue with the recursion until it reaches zero, and then it will fold up the computations, give us the result. And it turns out we can take this, uh, we can take this style of programming, let's say, pretty far. Uh, the computations that we can perform using just templates and uh, type definitions. Uh, they provide us a Turing complete means of computation. So any, any computable function that we can perform on a machine, it can be used, computed by templates. And of course, in practice, it, there are some limitations. The same way a C++ program will be limited by the amount of memory, the, the size of the stack, etc. We will also be limited by the uh, maximum depth of recursion that we can use in templates by the maximum uh, length of the of the template name for example because those can also stack if we if we uh, uh, if we put templates inside other templates um, so what I wanted to do next is provide an I think an interesting proof of concept when we will try to implement uh, an expression interpreter in templates so we will be able to provide uh, a template representing an expression and then um, use another template that will evaluate this expression and give us a result of this, of this evaluation. And everything can be expressed with just uh, type definitions and templates. So to, to begin something like that, we would need to encode the uh, natural numbers using types. And we can do, it, please do this uh, pretty easily. For zero, we will have just a structure named zero, which will uh, represent the type for, for the number zero. And each following number can be represented as a successor template that takes the previous number as its template argument. So as you can see, if we uh, substitute zero for the successor template, this will in our system represent one. If we put this as the template argument to successor again, it should represent the number two in our system. So as you can see, I'm not actually using any integers over here. Uh, we can theoretically provide any type to, to the successor template. But of course, we want to use this the, the, the way it was meant to be used to, to encode the natural numbers that we'll be using in our interpreter. I'm not actually handling any, uh, any I'm not using any error handling in this code. It is possible to, to expand code like this with with error with proper error handling and even error messages that will be more or less readable by by a human, but the, we will for, for the sake of simplicity, I will not focus on this in any way. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, when I when I'm talking, feel free to 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 interrupt me. Uh, otherwise, I will just just go on. Mm, so the next thing we would we want to describe is to have uh, variables in our in our uh, in our expressions, and to do this we'll have we'll need a way to bind variables to actual values, mm, and we'll do is do this with a structure that will represent an environment where each environment binds a set of uh, variable names to actual values for those variables, and as the names we'll actually use integers this time. Uh, so this will be like IDs of the of the variables that we uh, want to be using. And we're gonna just use one template to, to represent this, which will be named binding, because what it does, it binds a name, the first template argument provided to a value, which is the second template argument. And then the third template argument is an existing environment, an existing binding that we want to build on top of. So an example is, would be, could, could look like this. 
where we have an empty environment, which is the, the, the base case. So just a simple empty structure that we just use to, to provide the, the first argument for the, for the first binding. So this will be at the bottom of our environment. And then on top of that, we are binding the name B, uh, which we defined just here as, a, as an integer to the value of zero. And then on top of that, we bind name A to the value of one. So a successor to a successor to zero. <clears throat> and this is this is basically it. As you can see, I'm not, this is, uh, this looks kind of like a variable declaration, but this is, a, this is actually a type declaration, right? I'm using the using keyword. So this is like a type alias. So what we definitely want to be able to do is to look up uh, variable names in this environment. So given a, a name, we want to be able to find the value that corresponds to this name. And for that, we will be using the environment lookup uh, template. And we have several uh, several definitions for this to, to handle all the relevant cases. So the general uh, definition for, for the template, it just takes a name and takes an environment. And ideally it should, in a field inside, it should provide us with, uh, with the result of the lookup. Of course, in the general case, there is no, there is no result. Uh, here's a more specific case where we have a name and we are trying to look up on uh, the name in an empty environment, which we described before as an just uh, empty structure. So in this case, the name shouldn't be found. So there is no result field in this uh, template specialization, which will of course result in a, in a compilation error if we try to look up any name in an empty environment. And the next uh, easiest, uh, easiest implementation that actually succeeds the simplest case is where we are trying to look up the, the name in a binding that has this name bound to a value right on top of the environment. So we can see there's a, we as the environment, we are providing a binding between the name and some value. And then there's the rest of the environment as the third argument. So in this case, the result is just gonna be defined as the value of the name. Again, this is, this is a type declaration. A more complex case is if the if we are expecting the, the name and value pair to be bound somewhere somewhere deeper inside in the environment. So in this case, we have to uh, define a template specialization where the binding is between a different name and a different value. That's why we also need more template arguments over here. Um, so this name doesn't we assume this name doesn't match this name, because then it would match to this previous definition, the less specific one. <clears throat> but in this case, uh, we want to just take this, the remaining environment that is over here as the third argument um, and perform a recursive, recursive call on the environment lookup where we are looking, the, looking up the name that is interesting to us in this remaining environment. And then we take the result from the result field from this uh, lookup and we define this as the result of our lookup. So this is how it would, how it could be used uh, using the test environment that I defined above where name B was uh, bound to the value of zero. So we are performing the lookup of name B on the test environment. We are taking the result field of this lookup, defining this as type V. And then we are using this uh, STD is same um, template that will have a value of true or false, uh, depending if the types match each other or not. So if the type V is the same type as zero, then this will give us the value of true and the assert will succeed. If not, the static assert will fail. So all of this can still happen at uh, the time of compilation. <clears throat> so now we can start defining actual evaluation of, uh, of simplest, um, simplest expressions that we can uh, define in our pseudo language. 
Mm, and for that, we want to define a couple additional templates. So the first one would be a reference, which takes an ID of, of a variable, right? An integer name. So this will be like a, this just says that this name is a reference to a variable. So it's, it, it will be easier for the interpreter to interpret uh, an expression that consists of reference. And the same with a literal value. So a literal takes anything as, a, as its template argument and it just says that this is a literal value and not a reference. And then we will be using throughout the rest of, uh, of this rather complex example, the, the eval uh, template, which takes some expression as its first argument. It takes an environment as the second uh, ex, uh, argument. And ideally, it should give us a result field that will contain the result of evaluating the expression inside the environment provided. So for those simple cases of references and literals, uh, evaluating a literal value, it just evaluates to, to the uh, value t. So t would be defined as the result of the evaluation. And then if we have a reference, uh, where a name is, uh, is used, then we will have to look up this name in the environment provided and take the result of this, of this lookup and define this as the result of our evaluation. And then um, I'm also giving a kind of a simplified example how we could evaluate a function in our, uh, in our interpreter. So this assumes that the function will always take two arguments, um, n and m. So those are two uh, template arguments to, to this expression. And then of course the environment and the function itself, which is also a template taking two arguments. So we have to define this in this way uh, in the list of template arguments, which just says that this is some class fun that is taking two uh, template arguments itself. And to evaluate an expression like this, what we want to do is to evaluate the arguments first and then apply the function to the evaluated arguments the same way a regular interpreter should do. And to do this, we recursively call the evil uh, template with uh, respectively n and m as the arguments for the expression. We provide the environment that we got. We take the results of both of those re-evaluations and those results will be the template arguments for our function template. Then we take the result of this function, define this as the result of our evaluation. And once we have um, a way to evaluate functions with two arguments, we can try and define a function, uh, one, one of those functions. In the simplest case, it would be the addition. So of course, addition takes two arguments. This is the most general uh, definition of the template. So it takes n and m, and the result should be the result of addition of n to m. So we have two um, specializations for this uh, template definition. The first one assumes that the first argument is zero, right? So we're trying to add zero to some argument m. Of course, adding zero to m will just be m. So we define the result of such computation as m. If we have, uh, if we provide something else, it should be a successor to something, right? If it's not zero, then it should be some other natural number. In this case, we are kind of pushing this successor from the first argument to the second. So we are decrementing the first argument and incrementing the second argument and trying to uh, compute the result of that. So instead of having a successor to n and m, we are evaluating the addition of n to a successor of m. So this should be called recursively until the first argument is zero, in which case it will match to this first template and give us the second argument as the result. So we're kind of accumulating the result in the second argument to, to get the result of the addition. Mm, and using just this definition and the evaluation definition that we provided earlier, 
we can start to evaluate some uh, simple expressions. So in our case, it will be a nested addition. So here we are calling the evaluate. And as the first argument, as the expression, this is the expression. So it's an addition between a reference to a variable named uh, name A and another addition between name B and the literal value of two. So the evaluate template, it will look up those uh, those uh, variable names in the environment provided where name E matches to two, name B is bound to three. So then it should just to perform an addition of two to three, which is five, then add another two to it. And we should get a number of seven. And we can perform an assert to make sure that this is actually the result that we're getting, that this uh, definition of result uh, matches the definition of uh, sevenfold successor to zero, which is uh, seven in our system. So this was a kind of a specific case where the uh, the function has to take two arguments. Uh, but this is kind of a simplified case. And in a general case would be that uh, a function is something that takes a list of, of, uh, of arguments that can be as long as we want. It can be just one argument, two, or any number of arguments. And we can even define uh, functions that take variable number of arguments, right? <clears throat> so to, to define evaluation of such functions and the functions itself, we first would need a way to define lists and to evaluate those lists. So that's also pretty pretty simple to do. Um, I think this will look especially familiar to anyone that had any uh, any experience with functional languages or uh, or something like this, where we first define an empty list as an empty structure, and then any other list uh, is composed of a head, which is the first uh, element of the list, and a tail. That is a list representing the all the other elements. Mm. And then we need a way to evaluate those lists. And similarly to, to the way we defined the evaluation of, uh, of a function, we want to just uh, the result of evaluation of a list should be should also be a list where all the elements of the list are evaluated first. And this is what is happening here, right? We are trying to evaluate the list that is composed of a head and a tail. And we also have an environment because this is also always the second argument to the evil template. And then the result is defined as, as also a list where the head is the result of the evaluation of the head value in the environment. So we are taking the list head we are taking the environment, we are evaluating it, taking the result of this. And then the tail of the of the list is also the evil function recursively called on the tail of the of the list. And this this will stop when we reach the empty list that should always be the last element of any list. And also, of course, evaluation of an empty list just gives us an empty list as the result. Uh, so maybe first I will show you how a list uh, can look like. So if in, in case it's it's not very clear to any to anyone, um, and it's over here where, where I highlighted uh, part of the code. So this is a list declaration where the head, so the first argument would be the uh, would be n, and then all this would be the tail of the list which in our case was also a list where successor to M is the head and then the tail is uh, some other element. This could be, for example, the empty list. So if this tail would be an empty list, this would be a list of two elements, right? The first element is N, the second element is a successor to M and then the empty list marks the end of the list. 
So what we are doing here in the slide uh, is evaluating functions that are taking a list of arguments instead of a set number of arguments. And once we have the evaluation of lists done, this is gonna be uh, pretty simple. We just need one definition for this evaluation. So the eval now takes a function that is just taking one argument in reality, which is the list of arguments. And of course the environment. Here we have the template declaration. As you can see now function is only taking one template argument. And again, we are applying the function to the evaluation result of the arguments that are providing to it. So if this is a list, then this will evaluate to another list where all elements should be already evaluated and we can apply the function to them. And to make use of this uh, new way of defining functions, we can define another addition, but this time the addition will take a list of arguments instead of uh, just two of them. And all of the arguments provided in the list will be summed together into one result. So the general definition of the template declaration is, uh, is looking like this. It just takes one argument. So this is representing the list of arguments. And then if we are trying to perform an addition on a list that has only one element. So as you can see, there's just the head M and then the empty list, which closes the list of arguments. So if there's just one argument, then this argument is also the result of the addition, right? Now, if we have, a, we have another specialization when the first argument is zero, so also a very similar approach to how we approached the addition of two elements. So if the first element of the, of the list is zero, if the head of the list is zero, then we are just discarding it and we are performing the addition on the tail of the list. And this will be our result. And then the most complex case where we're actually doing the uh, the accumulation to to compute the addition. So here we assume that we have a list that has at least two arguments because otherwise it was much match to the previous definition. And we also assume that the first argument of the list is not a zero because then it will also match to a, div to a previous declaration. So if it's not a zero, it must be a successor to something because those are already evaluated values. Uh, and if that is the case, then again, we are performing an, a recursive call to an addition where we are decrementing the first argument of the list, incrementing the second argument of the list, and then the rest of the list is for now uh, unchanged that the tail of the list is just uh, provided as is. And then this, the result of this will be a result of our call. And again, an example of how, how it would look in practice. So this is actually the same uh, addition that we performed earlier, but instead of doing a nested addition where we are using one addition expression as, a, as the argument to, to another addition, we are just providing a list with all the arguments that we want to sum together. So here we have a list where the head is the variable A, and then the tail is a, another list. And in this list, the head is the name B, and the tail is another list. And in this last list, the, the head is the value two, and the tail is the empty list. So in practice, this is a free element list with name A, name B, and the literal value of two. We sum those all together, taking into consideration the values that are bound to the variable names, and we should be getting seven again. <clears throat> so almost all, um, all languages that are worth uh, Parsing like this should also have a branching statements. So this can also be pretty easily represented with, uh, with only templates. So we'll define an if statement template. So this is an expression uh, which is taking three template arguments. The first would be a condition for the if. So basically something that should evaluate to either, either true or false. Uh, if the condition is true, then we should evaluate the 
second argument uh, and if it's false then we evaluate the third argument we provide the basic uh, type declarations for the values of uh, true and false again empty structures uh, and we provide three ways to evaluate the expression. So the first way to evaluate would be uh, a template specialization when we know that the first argument to the if expression is just a literal true value. And in this case, we just using we just evaluate the then expression, so the second argument. We provide it to another uh, recursive call to the evil template. If the first argument is false, then of course we take the else statement, the third argument, we evaluate this inside our environment and take the results. And the third uh, possible possibility is that the condition matches neither true or false. In this case, we just want to uh, evaluate this expression. So we are calling evaluate on the condition inside the environment. We are taking the result of this evaluation. And again, we are kind of substituting this result to the original condition that was provided. And we are creating this other if expression with the condition evaluated already. And we try to evaluate it again, since uh, this is an expression that should evaluate to true or false. So after applying this evaluation to the condition, this should al already match to one of the previous uh, template specializations. And again, a short example. So we can evaluate uh, an if expression that has the literal false value over here. So the evil will first try to evaluate this. This will of course evaluate to just value false. And in this case, it will take the third argument as the result, which is the a successor to zero, so one. And the result of course should match to, to this exact definition. Now, the, I think the more interesting example of what we can do with this uh, by expanding this, uh, this parser, this interpreter, would be to be able to define lambda expressions. Uh, so lambda expressions would be something like, a, like an anonymous, anonymous function. Uh, so a function that we do not have to define previously with a template uh, declaration in case of our uh, template metaprogramming. So this is a function that can be defined just inside the expression that we are trying to evaluate. And to be able to define lambdas and to use them in expressions, we need to define two new templates. First one would be for the lambda itself. And this one takes two template arguments. The first one is the formal name for the uh, for the argument to the lambda, and then the body of the lambda, which is uh, containing the actual expression to be evaluated on the variable provided as the as the name. And then, if we want to use this lambda to apply it to an actual argument, we need an apply uh, or an application template. So this one takes a function, a lambda. And an argument that uh, should be applied, that this lambda should be applied to. So an example can look like this. Here we have a lambda expression defined. So the name is x. So this is a lambda that is taken in a variable uh, x. And what it does on this uh, x variable, uh, it just performs an addition with uh, an x and a one as the arguments. So it just increments the whatever is provided as, as the argument by one. And we can use the application template to apply this lambda to the literal value of, uh, of two. So this is just a lambda that takes anything, increments it by one, and here it is applied to the value of two. So this should evaluate to the value of uh, three. And to be able to, to evaluate lambda expressions, 
um, we need to bind whatever is uh, provided as the second argument to the application. Because as you remember, the application takes the lambda and an argument. So this should be bound to the name uh, of the lambda. So then it can be uh, substituted uh, to all the occurrences of the of x inside the lambda body. So this is how the evaluation uh, has to be defined. It's an evaluation of the application uh, template, right? Inside an environment as always. And the application is between a lambda that has a name and a body and an argument. And what we do is we are trying to evaluate the body of the lambda inside the environment, but we are uh, expanding this environment by a new binding. And this is the binding between the variable name uh, that is provided with the lambda and the evaluation of the argument that is uh, being provided here to the application. So continuing the example from the previous slide, if we try to apply this uh, lambda expression to the to a reference to the name A, and then we provide an environment when this name A is bound to the value of two. Um, then of course the evaluation would first try to uh, will we'll provide an environment when this uh, X is bound to uh, to this value. And then if we try to evaluate the body of the lambda, uh, this will actually try to perform an addition between the variable name A and the literal value of uh, one. So it will look up name A in the environment, perform the addition and give us the result that we need. So this is almost almost the end because this is the that's all I wanted to sh to 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 show about this uh, this rather convoluted example of uh, uh, templates template interpreter of, of expressions, and I have just uh, a couple slightly more practical examples that uh, could maybe be used in a in in production code, but also make use of the of template meta programming. So the first uh, the first example would be to use template motor programming to generate uh, some more complex complex tables. Um, so the table that we will generate is going to be computed at compile time. So this could be, for example, a lookup table that we need to use somewhere else in the code, and we don't want to spend any actual runtime on generating this table, but we also don't want to have to type at the table by hand. Of course, I think in the newest uh, C++ standards, it's actually a bit easier to do because the const expression um, keyword is uh, more powerful. You are able to, to define, to use it on uh, some types of uh, functions to com compute those functions at compile time instead of at runtime. Uh, but here again, we will just try to use only templates to, to generate the table. And again, use the mechanism of uh, template recursion to, to generate a, template, a table of, uh, at, uh, at compile time. Mm. So this is actually the table definition where we are creating a constant expression this is the type, so it's an array of integers of the size, table size, it's named table, and we'll use this uh, helper uh, template to actually generate the, all the values. What we want to do is to generate a, ta ta uh, a table where each, uh, each field of the template of the, oh, sorry, of the table contains the square root, uh, sorry, square value of the index of the table. So it will go like uh, 0, 1, then uh, 4, 9, and so on. And uh, the first definition of this, of this helper template, as you can see, it takes, uh, uh, it takes two template arguments. 
And the first one has a default value of zero. As you can see, we are not providing any template arguments to the helper. So this will actually resolve to, um, to the uh, to a template definition, the declaration with the index substituted with uh, zero. And then we have a variable number of, uh, of integer uh, template arguments. Since this is a variable number of arguments, it might as well be zero arguments, which is what will match to our call right here. And then the, the actual structure of the helper, it will inherit from another uh, template instantiation of the same uh, helper uh, template. But this time the index will be incremented by one. So we are moving along through the table, generating uh, more and more elements. And here we have the variable number of uh, arguments that was provided here, which in our base case was of course, uh, no arguments. And at the end of the argument list, we are putting another argument, which is gonna be the square of the index that was provided. So if this was zero, as was the case here, basically, then this will match um, to zero times zero, which will also give us zero. But what, what is actually happening here, because this uh, recursive definition, it will all match again to the same uh, template specialization. But this time, instead of index zero, this index will have a value of one, right? It no longer will use the default value of zero because we actually provided an index this time with a value of one. And we actually did provide a variable number of arguments because we provided the one argument, which was the square of the first index. So this will match again to the same template and it will again increment the index value by one. So now it will inherit from a helper declaration that has the index value of two. This uh, variable number of arguments now contains the first element of the table that we provided previously, right? We previously provided the index, the square of index zero. So this goes over here. And at the end, we are providing another argument, the square of index one. And again, this will continue happening, right? We'll continue to accumulate the uh, values for the array over here and the index will keep going up. So we'll be incrementing the index, putting another template argument at the end of the variable list of uh, arguments. And this will keep happening until we can match this other definition. And this other, this other second definition, it actually assumes that the first argument matches the table size. So if this happens, we actually reached the table size that we wanted to, to declare, which was 10 in our case. And if we did this, then the variable list of arguments that we provided here, it should already contain 10 elements that we kept uh, accumulating over here. And since it does, we are just defining the table field of this final uh, helper call as um, an array that contains just all the indices, all the values that we've been accumulating. So now this will kind of fold up and the first helper, the declaration that we try to use over here, it will inherit from this final definition. Uh, and this final definition actually had the table field defined. So this is what we are trying to use and access here. So this way we are kind of recursively calling um, this, uh, this part, accumulating the, the elements of the array until we have the array that we, that we are looking for. And then the second, second example, this one is I think the most uh, usable of everything that uh, I've, been, I've been maybe showing. I've been actually encountering uh, a lot of code that looks like this in the production code that I'm working on right now. And it was pretty unreadable for me at first, first look. I had to spend some time to actually understand what is uh, happening in a code like this. But what it is trying to accomplish, it is trying to create a template that uh, 
that can tell us we can provide any type to the template. The template is called is incrementable. And then the value, it, it will tell us if this type uh, can accept the plus plus operator. So if it can, the value will be true. If it cannot, then the value would be false. And we can use this to uh, in our code to make some branching to decide what we're going to do uh, next with our uh, generic code. <clears throat> so to do this, we want to create two specializations for this is incrementable template. And the first one will only match, uh, and the, the, the second more specific one will only match if the type is actually incrementable. If it's not, it should fail. It will only match then to the uh, default template uh, declaration, which inherits from the false type. This may be also something that I should uh, mention. The std false type is just a structure where the value field equals to false. And accordingly, yes, that the true type is, uh, uh, is a type where the value field is equal to true. So those are useful in situations like this. So we are inheriting from one of them when we don't want, when we decide that this uh, type is not incrementable. If we decide that the type is actually incrementable, then we, then we inherit from the second one, the, the true type. Mm. So the first argument to the template is, uh, of course, the type that we want to check. And then uh, the second will also always have a We'll have a default value over here, which is just uh, a void type. And in the second instantiation, we will try to mm, we try to match this uh, this template against a type that looks like this. So we need to create a type that will only resolve. It will only match if the uh, if type T can be can have the plus plus operator applied. So these are pretty recent, at least from from my perspective, uh, additions to the uh, C++ standard. Uh, the decal val and uh, decal type keywords. Or uh, maybe those are not technically keywords. I'm not sure what I should call them. This looks. Uh, this is actually a, a, a template definition. This is more like a, like a function. I guess uh, decal type would be more popular, more more widely used in C++ because it provides us the uh, the type of uh, whatever we whatever expression we give us the argument to it. And what we are trying to give it as an argument, we are taking the type declaration, the the, the type name that was provided as the argument to the template. And we are trying to kind of instantiate it using the decal val uh, template. What it does is uh, it instantiates the type, but without calling any actual uh, constructor. So this is the, the application. Uh, um, Functor that is uh, called to to perform this uh, pseudo instantiation of the of the value. Mm, so there's no actual value created that could be used by the compiler for anything, but it is it will be treated as the as a value of type t uh, for purposes of parsing the expression. So we can now apply the plus plus uh, operator. To, to this expression, because this expression uh, it behaves like a, as, a, as a value of type T. Mm. So now we are taking the type of this expression, this plus plus expression, mm. and we are using this void T template. This was the part that I found the hardest to understand when I first uh, try to read uh, through this code. But what this uh, void t template does, it takes any argument uh, and then it basically um, becomes the, the void type. 
but to to do this the argument that was provided the template argument that is provided actually has to resolve to an existing type and uh, as you can see this will only happen if we can get the type of this expression expression successfully and this will in turn only happen if we can actually apply the plus plus operator to uh, to a value of type t so if uh, t is a type that can be can have the plus plus operator applied then this will actually have a type this expression and then this void t will resolve into an actual void that can be uh, provided as the second argument here to the this incrementable uh, function and only when trying to understand this i came across the the acronym uh, spina which uh, stands for uh, substitute failure is not an error and what this means in in, in practice spe specifically in uh, c++ is that we when writing this uh, this template declaration we are expecting this uh, substitution substitution this type substitution to uh, to actually fail if uh, the type is not incrementable right if we cannot increment this type, then this uh, type substitution will fail, but the compiler with, will not stop with an error telling us that it cannot increment this, this value. Instead, it will just abandon trying to match this template at all, and it will revert to the default uh, template uh, definition that is over here. And it will match to this one instead, then it will inherit from the false type and it would just give us the value false for this uh, template specialization over here. Okay, so that's that's the last example that I wanted to to provide. And this this ends our, our my my presentation on uh, on template metaprogramming in C plus plus. So if there's any questions uh, or remarks, I would be glad to hear them. <laughs>